a latrine down the road. Why don't you take a jump? Do you realize that I'm your superior officer? Probably be more likely to see this scenario in the French army than in the German army, which was highly disciplined. Today, we're looking at Marques all quite on the Western Front, which really gives us a great view into what warfare was like during World War I. So in this opening scene, you see the French are advancing against the German positions across what's called no man's land. There's barbed wire everywhere. Barbed wire, of course, is introduced in America by Joseph Glidden. I'm sure he's super shocked to see what becomes of the barbed wire that was created to keep cattle contained, that ultimately it's used to keep out the enemy and hold them up so you can shoot them. You can see the German helmets, right? Those are far more fearsome with kind of that spear. As the war goes on, and you'll even see it in this movie, they'll change helmets. The Germans uh, created a helmet that was far more uh, protective. And so you'll kind of see as they shift through the movie, the men who got there early still wear this kind of helmet, and the more recent recruits get the better helmet. And I don't know how well you can see like the trees, kind of like these twigs and so forth. I remember uh, one survivor of the Battle of Verdun talking about how after a bombardment, he looked up and these beautiful green trees had basically been transformed. And when he looked back, he thought it was a Christmas tree. All kinds of reds and other colors hanging from the tree. And when his eyes focused, he realized that it was body parts of humans hanging from those trees. Imagine the shock that these soldiers have to deal with and cope with. And of course, the machine gun invented by Maxim uh, early on with the idea that it would end war, ironically. Uh, but instead, it becomes a great killing machine. And I, I don't know about you, but just trying to visualize being these men day after day, knowing that you're going to charge into this. At, what, what's going through your, your mind? What are you thinking about? right? Had to be pretty overwhelming for most of these young men. Now, notice the French have attacked and they're falling back. And now it's time for the Germans to counterattack. This goes on day after day, year after year. It just boggles the mind. You can just see the number of men who die in every advance. And so you can understand why this war kills more soldiers than, than any war prior to World War I. Today we talk about post-traumatic syndrome and so forth. They're gonna experience it in a, in, in a major way. It'll be called being shell-shocked by what they experience, the endless shells that land, facing death every day. Some of the side effects of that will be some men won't be able to speak, some won't be able to see, some won't be able to hear, even though there isn't anything even physically wrong with them. It's just the horror of facing this every day. The tank eventually becomes important. They won't ever be used properly in World War I, so it's not until World War II that they're effectively used as a, a screen to protect these advancing men. They, they even tried for a little while where they took these pieces of metal with little slits in them on wheels and they tried to push them. Can you imagine trying to push these little pieces of metal on wheels through barbed wire and craters? Uh, it, it just didn't work. More coffins. It's like a bigger load than usual. That means a bigger offensive. Early on in the war, before the planes become more sophisticated and start having dogfights, they basically did reconnaissance. And how they would report to prepare their lines for an enemy attack is they'd fly over and they'd see all these coffins arriving. And they'd go, okay, a big attack's coming. We, we need to have men in this section. How old are you? 16. Next year, right out of the cradle. And as the war goes on, both sides begin to use younger and younger soldiers because they're running out of men. And so the age begins to both drop and increase. Towards the end of the war, you're going to have 13, 14 year old kids out there, and then you're going to have old men like me out there because you need bodies. But you send in these, these kids, they're terrified, they don't know what to expect. And so Kat, uh, one of the main characters, he is going to try to give them a, a little talk in preparation. Did you notch this bayonet? Yes, sir. Who told you to? Back at the training camp. Yeah. Training camp, huh? If the enemy ever caught you at this, they wouldn't kill you. They'd plump your eyes out, fill them full of sawdust. Nobody uses these things anymore. It's by mutual agreement on both sides. So those notched bayonets, when they would go into your stomach, they would catch onto your intestine. And when you would pull the bayonet out, you would literally pull someone's intestines out. And now, you're not gonna be dead. 
There you are, right, on the battlefield with all your intestines literally in your hands. And so the soldier said, no more of this, right? This warfare is horrible enough. First time at the front? Yes, sir. Don't serve me. I'm a private. Why is a private giving these orders? Quite often you would see a sergeant would be doing this, right? But a lot of the sergeants are dead. So here's an experienced man, even though he's a private, he's like their sergeant now. Your spade is better. You hit a man under the chin with a spade, you can take his head right off. Mother of God. And it's cleaner. Bayonet gets stuck in a man's ribs, you have to kick him to pull it out. There are multiple stories of the battlefield where two guys drive their bayonets into one another at the same time, right? And they both die. Or while you drive your bayonet in, it gets stuck in those ribs and you can't get it out and then allow somebody else then to come and bayonet you or shoot you. Think about your entrenches. There's not a lot of room, right? You're in close quarter combat. You have a long rifle with a bayonet. That means you need room to attack and advance and kill someone with a bayonet. Hard to do in a trench when somebody's jumping over the trench to kill you. So Cat is saying the shovel is much more effective. Corporal who? Himmel stuff. From Oldenburg training station. Yes, sir. How did the little pig mess up his playground? Now, don't tell me you volunteered for frontline action. Oh, no, sir. He got into trouble. He overdid it with a couple of trainees on the muddy field. Unfortunately, uh, sometimes in war, uh, certain men who are predisposed to not being particularly good guys take advantage of their position. And that's what Himmelstoss did to him. He was very brutal in the boot camp. It's a latrine down the road. Why don't you take a jump? Do you realize that I'm your superior officer? Do you want to be court-martialed? <laughs> Stand up straight, put your heels together. Your superior officer speaks to you. I love you! Scott! Now, I, I've got to say, uh, the imagery here we see is as the war goes on, discipline's breaking down. Probably be more likely to see this scenario in the French army than in the German army, which was highly disciplined. But the fact is, even the German army towards the end was was having problems, uh, not to the level of the French. As you see so many people die, so many officers die, that that natural order that you find in the military begins to break down. So of course that was Corporal Himmelstoss, and here he is being a coward, right? He's huddled there actually with a bunch of young kids that he's supposed to be leading. Now, what's interesting is a little later in the movie, he's awarded the Iron Cross by the Kaiser, Kaiser Wilhelm, the ruler of Germany himself, for being heroic. And I think one of the interesting things that you see in there is this idea, can men one moment be cowards and the next moment be brave in combat? And I think the answer is yes. And I always like to remind people, War may end at a particular place when someone signs a treaty, but it doesn't mean it ends for the person who participated, the person who lost a leg or had to kill someone. That war doesn't necessarily end for them. And that's why it's so important that we encourage and honor veterans. If your own father came over with them, you wouldn't hesitate to fling a bomb into him. Now the French can go through those holes in the barbed wire. Notice Cat is using a shovel. And notice how close the trenches are. The German trenches were nicer than the French trenches, and there actually was a little bit more space and not as dirty and filthy, but still not a lot of space to, to fight. And so you can see this hand-to-hand -hand combat, how tough it is, and to be able to take a bayonet and drive it into somebody, that, that takes some force. The days are hot and the dead lie unburied. The shells will bury them. But when the wind blows towards us, it brings the smell of blood, which is heavy and sweet. I want you to think about this. I mean, all these men are dying. You don't retrieve all of them. When shells go off, many of them are partially buried. And then as other shells explode, then their bodies are uncovered again. There's a famous story of one guy who was buried near a trench and his, only his arm was sticking out with his hand sticking out. And so when the men were ready to go over the top, they would all go by and slap his hand for good luck. Paul is talking about the sweet smell of death. I don't know if you've ever smelled a dead animal before. Can you imagine what that battlefield smells like with so many dead people? And do you get used to something that terrible? What I like about this particular scene is it shows Paul by himself. 
of course, the main character of All Quiet on the Western Front. I think it shows that how most soldiers ha sometimes have to feel that they're all alone. That's why when you talk to most veterans and soldiers, they talk about the importance of comradeship, that they're fighting for one another, they need each other. So in this scene, they really focus on Paul being by himself, he's not with his buddies. So you get that sense of he is facing this, this horror ultimately alone. Now look at the size of these craters. Some of these craters from these shells, I mean, they are so deep you could fit houses in them. Pretty horrible. He just stabbed a Frenchman. But the Frenchman's not gonna die. And Paul is gonna be pinned in this crater by artillery and machine gun fire with this Frenchman for the entire night. And this Frenchman will just lay there and suffer. And Paul's starting to think, oh my gosh, I this is a human being. I think they have this coping mechanism to say they're not humans, so you can kill them. And now he's up close and personal. He sees him and he, he, he pulls his papers out and he realizes, oh my gosh, he has a wife and kids. But then when he begins to read the Frenchman's diary, he discovers that the Frenchman has killed Germans as well. And Paul goes back to his hardened self saying, we're all, in this position now. We have to kill one another. And in the morning he leaves the trench and the Frenchman uh, as well.